Welcome to the Jason Podcast. I'm Josie Briggs, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Each month, we talk about work in the current issue with the hope this conversation will prompt you, our listeners, to go to our website or turn to the latest issue that is now in your mailbox. In the December issue, we are publishing several papers that deal with interesting issues in renal transplantation. So I'm very delighted to have with me today to talk about this work, Dr. John Gill. John is Professor of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. He's the Jason Associate Editor, who is our in-house expert on matters related to clinical research on renal transplantation. Dr. Gill, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Josie. I'm glad to be here. So, John, to start, let me say I've really enjoyed having the benefit of your uh, ongoing advice on all the transplant studies we see at Jason. We really have a great editorial team in the transplant arena. Uh, your your uh, strong expertise, uh, the European perspective we have from Matt Griffin, and we have terrific input from editorial fellows. Uh, one of our previous fellows was Matt Hafmenon and currently Sai Hussein. These are young renal scientists for whom transplantation is their focus. So uh, with this great team, we, we discuss uh, transplant papers quite extensively during our weekly meeting, and I'm always delighted when there's a transplant paper on the agenda because I know I will learn a lot. In fact, I, I'm proud to say that I think we're seeing some of the best scientific work on kidney transplantation uh, overall. Do you agree, and do you have any comments? I agree we've got a great team. Um, the integration of the clinical and basic and translational science on the editorial board is is fantastic. You know, Jason really is, uh, I think, a highly respected journal in the kidney transplant community. It's widely read and definitely um, uh, highly respected. It's definitely the right place for work that uh, is of broad interest, uh, not only to the transplant community, but to the entire nephrology community. So I would echo your comments. Yeah. I, I worry at times that we are seeing some pressure for transplant nephrology to be seen in some ways as a separate subspecialty. Uh, thinking back to when I was on the faculty at the University of Michigan now, this is quite some time ago, but I, I had to round on the transplant service one month a year, and I, and I actually loved it. It was one of my favorite rotations. Uh, many happy patients' decisions were uh, reasonably straightforward usually, and when they weren't, we had a great team uh, to back us up and discuss them. We clearly need transplant experts, but my own hope is that care for the transplant patient, both the lead up and the follow on, it needs to stay embedded in general nephrology. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, you and I are on the same page here. I, I definitely believe that transplantation has to stay an integral part of nephrology. And in my mind, there's, you know, three major reasons for this. The first is, is there's a growing population of prevalent transplant patients that are out there over 250,000 in the United States alone. And these patients really need specialized long-term care. Um, it's so important for, you know, optimizing the, the survival of the transplant. So that's the first issue. It's just a straight, um, huge clinical responsibility that cannot be delivered by transplanters alone. The, the second issue really is, is, is related to access to transplantation. Um, patients need to be, uh, receive timely education about transplantation options, uh, to consider preemptive transplantation, living donor transplantation. And then in my experience, that's best accomplished when education about transplantation is really embedded in our chronic kidney disease clinics uh, so that there's time for planning um, and so that transplantation is really uh, discussed up front as an option when uh, kidney failure is, is uh, going to be part of the, the patient's outcome. And the third, I think potentially the most exciting, is, is there's really tremendous scientific overlap you know, for example, the advancements in science that we see in uh, glomerular diseases in the native kidney and in acute kidney injury are really directly applicable um, to the, you know, the situation in transplantation where we're looking at recurrent glomerular diseases and ischemic reperfusion injury, uh, delayed graft function. So, you know, while transplantation is becoming a distinct entity, the, the, um, uh, it, it has to remain an integral component of nephrology, both for clinical and scientific advancement. Mm 
Right. T- terrific summary. Before transplantation, after it, and for the nature of the science that we need to, to see happening. Okay, let's get to work on the papers that are in this issue. The first that I thought we should discuss is a paper entitled HLA-DQ Mismatches Lead to More Unacceptable Antigens, Greater Sensitization, Sensitization Increased Disparity, as demonstrated in repeat transplant candidates. The first author of this uh, fine paper is Dylan Isaacson. The senior author is Anna, Anna Tambor. I gather that the scientific consensus has been that HLA-DQ mismatches can be more or less ignored, or at least they're not considered in many kidney matching algorithms, including the U.S. kidney allocation system. Is that correct? And and how did these uh, investigators go about uh, looking into this issue? Yeah, I mean, the role of DQ, uh, the understanding of the DQ gene locus and its importance, particularly in the development of antibody-mediated rejection, has really been interrogated in smaller single-center type studies. And so the authors here are really interested in determining the importance of HLA mismatches at the DQ gene locus in terms of the development of antibody-mediated rejection specifically. Um, and they really want to assess the uh, the uh, importance of DQ relative to mismatches at the other HLA loci, loci. And so what they did here was really kind of exploit some of the strengths of the um, scientific registry of transplant recipients, which is our national data system on transplant, for their analysis. Um, a unique feature of the SRTR is that it includes information on all transplant events and updates patient characteristics each time um, a patient is listed for transplantation and at each transplant event. What the data set doesn't include is information about longitudinal clinical changes, including the development of anti-HLA antibodies during the period that the transplant is functioning, um, including the development of of donor-specific antibodies. So that information is not uh, captured uh, while a transplant is functioning. So to get around this limitation, the author is really focused on patients who had failed a first transplant and then came back to be relisted for a second transplant. And so when a patient is relisted, um, the SRTR collects information on what we call unacceptable antigens. These are really HLA antigens that the transplant candidate cannot um, re- receive because they develop antibodies against those antigens. Um, and uh, the authors really in this paper propose that the presence of these antibodies at the time of relisting uh, would be indicative of donor-specific antigen uh, antibodies that had appeared during the first transplant. So it's a very valid mm-hmm. hypothesis, but they're uh, exploiting uh, that unique feature of the SRTR database to kind of get an a understanding of what these DQ mismatches might mean in terms of sensitization. Right. It's a great strategy. It's it's actually quite clever. So what were the critical findings? Yeah, so they were able to confirm their hypothesis that these DQ antigens relative to mismatches at some of the other uh, gene loci really were associated with the development of unacceptable antigens at the time of relisting for a second transplant. So really demonstrating that these mismatches were uh, overall associated with the development of new antibodies specific to the first donor. And they also intriguingly found that there were some differences in ethnic minority groups. So this effect seemed to be stronger in African-American patients and uh, some his- and, and the Hispanic patients, particularly in the patients who'd received a first living donor transplant. So it's very interesting. Now, is this strong enough to suggest matching algorithms should change? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's the time old question. You know, the, the, the yin and yang of increased matching uh, is always a concern that you may decrease a, a equity and access to transplantation. And that's because the people that are listed for a transplant are, are different than the people that are donating organs. And so it's mm-hmm. always a fine balance in terms of being able to uh, find the right mix. So if you, uh, what this study would suggest is, is that is if you matched on the DQ um, antigens, you would prevent some of the sensitization 
Um, and that might be particularly important, not only for the survival of the first transplant, but also in patients who might need a repeat transplant. Um, you know, the, how we actually um, uh, implement this in, in clinical practice or in policy, I think needs more um, uh, study. But one thing that would be sensical would be to say for patients who develop kidney failure at a young age, um, and may need more, more than one transplant in their lifetime, you might have more emphasis on matching, whether it be at DQ loci or other loci. And in older patients where equity and, and making sure um, a rapid transplantation is, is, a, is an issue, um, there you might de-emphasize matching. So it might not be a one-size-fits-all approach, and I think we do need to think differently in certain subpopulations. We all know that for some of our younger patients, they're going to need more than one transplant in their lifetime. Where I think, uh, I think we need some pause on this paper is, is whether there's a differential effect in certain ethnic groups. So I think this is premature to suggest that we might wait DQ matching differently, for example, in, in uh, patients of African-American ancestry or Hispanic ancestry. I think that these observational data um, here are provocative, that there might be a differential effect, but there's a lot of other uh, potential confounding factors here, including how the patients were treated after the return to dialysis um, uh, after their first failed transplant and what level of immunosuppression they, re they received, et cetera. So I think that part of it, I think, needs further study for sure. Yeah. I, I think we're learning over and over again that anything that diminishes access has to be uh, approached with enormous caution because there's no question they're better off with a kidney than on dialysis. Okay. The next paper in this issue that I think is also important for people to take a look at is, is entitled Bounced uh, Human Organ Transplant Transcripts Correlate with Allograft Pathology and Outcome. Importance of uh, capillaritis. Uh, it's a large, this paper is a large team effort from investigators at MGH and Hokkaido in Japan. First corresponding author is Ivy Rosales. The senior author is Robert Colvin. This paper is an attempt to get at the molecular mechanisms of late graft dysfunction. You and your co-authors, uh, Vincent Riazzi and Cunningham, wrote an editorial about this work. Your title is straightforward enough. You, it's called A Step Towards Understanding the Story Behind the Pictures, Molecular Diagnostics and the Band Classification. But the editorial you wrote begins with a surprising and somewhat outrageous first sentence here. I'm going to quote you. You wrote, kidney transplantation is mired in mediocrity. Wow. Yeah. That <laughs> surprised me. I've, I've always thought of transplantation as a great success story. So how do you justify this inflammatory statement, well, it, Dr. Bill? It, 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 well, it might have been a, a particularly rainy day in Vancouver when, when we when we penned that first sentence, but I think it's really pointing to the realization that, you know, we have not seen significant improvements in long-term transplant survival. Um, and importantly, I think, you know, the community is a bit frustrated in the fact that we've not seen the introduction of a novel immunosuppressant being approved for transplantation in, in nearly two decades. And, you know, when we stand back, we can sort of get upset about that. But but part of the problem is, is that our understanding of the diseases that really lead to allograft failure is really incomplete. We're still living in a world where we have sort of what I would call grab bag descriptive diagnoses. In the past, you know, uh, it was very common to be discussing chronic allograft nephropathy. Um, but there still are current examples that are very, you know, was what we live with on a day-to-day -day basis. Terms like IFTA, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, a descriptive term. Similarly, transplant glomerulopathy. Um, and it, these descriptive terms, though used for, for classification, they don't really help tease out the underlying pathophysiology. And because of that, we're not identifying novel therapeutic targets um, that are going to lead to the approval of new therapeutics that can improve long-term outcomes. So we really need to uh, sort of move beyond uh, sort of the descriptive and get to the underlying uh, molecular and genetic basis of these diseases. 
Now, as an aside, I mean, the other major issue in white elephant in the room is is the issue of premature death with a functioning transplant. But maybe we, right. we, can, park, we can park that one for, for, maybe, for maybe a future podcast. No, that is, uh, we had a, an excellent paper dealing with that a, a few months ago, and, and it is an important issue that needs more discussion. But but about the molecular mechanisms of late graft dysfunction, how are the authors uh, uh, approaching this, uh, and where do you think this is going right now? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, such a, uh, uh, an exciting but rapidly evolving field. Really, we're seeing advances in RNA sequencing, which now allow us to determine the messenger RNA that's being expressed in single cells. And these approaches are obviously very powerful, but what they're lacking is, is they don't have the ability, these sort of single sequence type of approaches don't allow us to have structural context, meaning, you know, the function of a cell in relation to all the other cells that are around it in the cellular microenvironment is really missing when you do those uh, sort of homogenized approaches or single cell approaches. So these new technologies really allow resolution of the transcriptome or what's happening at the cellular level in terms of microRNA expression in two and three dimensions. In this particular study, the researchers used the NanoString and Coulter platform, which is, is, the, uh, is, is the technology that they're using, and they're looking at the expression of the BAMP human organ transplant gene panel, which is really a um, uh, a panel of about 800 genes that have been grouped together um, in terms of genes that are expressed with certain disease entities. And they really tried to quantify um, those um, BAMF transcripts in about three over 300 archived renal biopsies that they had available. And the whole goal here was to correlate the transcripts with the um, individual BAMF pathology scores from the same tissue uh, blocks that had been done. So this is really interesting uh, work in terms of trying to get the, the transcriptome overlaid on top of the architecture of, of, of what we're actually seeing on the histo on the, in the histology. Yeah, and I think this is um, a, the issue of what happens in, the, in interstitial fibrosis is, of course, not limited to the transplant setting. It, it's important for the progression. Actually, all forms of kidney disease, including ones where the pathology starts in the glomerulus. So there may be generalizable insights here, but but where does this need to go now? What what's what are the next steps to turn this into answers that can actually move into therapies? Yeah, I mean, first I think it's worth saying what the authors were able to do with this paper. They were really able to correlate gene sets with um, different types of rejection, including T cell mediated rejection and antibody mediated rejection. So, but I would consider most of those findings confirmatory. I think the real advance here is really the demonstration of proof of concept that we can perform transcriptomic analysis that will provide us injury at the cellular level and be able to integrate this information with our traditional histological diagnoses. I think that bridging is really important. Um, to date, you know, as you know, most of the transcriptomic studies have been performed in what I call homogenized tissue or pooled samples from microdissection studies. And in this study, the authors are really able to show the anatomical localization of those transcripts, if you will. And the term that's been bantied about is sort of histomolecular integration. And, and this is really exciting. The limitations, I think, are, are, are really worth discussing, however. Um, and the first is, 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 you know, we need to kind of integrate these approaches with what's happening in the clinic. So there's not a clinical integration here. And what I mean by that is, is in this particular sample of about 300 biopsies, there may be heterogeneity in the expression of the genes that we're seeing that's related to very simple things like the timing of the biopsy or whether different mm -hmm. immunosuppressors have been applied or in fact treatments for the rejection have been applied. So that clinical integration could lead to uh, quite a bit of heterogeneity. Um, you know, and I think that that's something we should acknowledge. We're also obviously at here looking at gene sets that we already know about. So 
in terms of new discovery. And there's always, you know, the, 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 you have to have the realization that it might be the, the loudest signal that's, that's, um, you know, driving our attention. So transcripts that are more subtle, but are important in triggering the diseases may be obscured by what I would call the effector genes uh, that are overabundant. So integrating all of this, I think what has to happen is we really need to um, get to a place where we're doing very carefully done um, protocol biopsy driven timed samples where we have good correlation with the clinical information to really understand the, path of the, 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 the pathophysiology of what's going on. The huge advantage with transplant obviously is, is, is we know what time zero is. We often have a, a, an implant biopsy. And so these studies can be done, but they're going to need collaboration. And I also think they're going to need partnerships with our patients. Our patients don't want to come for protocol biopsies, but I think we've got a great um, you know, uh, potential tool here. What we need to do is, is, is bring the patients along to understand that, look, if we're going to get to a better place, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and do very careful prospective studies using this powerful technology. Yeah, building the partnerships with patients will, will clearly be essential here. And, and I think many of our patients understand very clearly how life-saving the transplants are. So I think that partnership can be built, but, but it's, it's a task. It's an important one. Well, this is indeed uh, very interesting. Uh, you're reminding me of early discuss discussions with about microarrays when we saw how how we needed to distinguish the noise from the signals that mattered. It, it's a, it's a recurrent problem when you have these uh, omic techniques is is to know how to analyze the, the and and pull out the true signal through through the noise of many many findings. Very exciting. So, John, thank you so much. Uh, I hope, and to our listeners, I hope this conversation has intrigued you to dig into the, these two papers and to re read the provocative editorial by Dr. Gill and his co-authors. We think this work is suggesting important uh, directions, not just for research into transplant, but ultimately also for transplant care. And John, thank you so much for all you do for the journal. Thanks, Josie. It's a pleasure. And yeah, please check out the papers. They're great reads and, and, and provocative stuff. So thanks very much for the opportunity. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. All rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare professional if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.